G'day, Jared Powell here, back for another instalment of On the Shoulders of Giants. Today I've got a wonderful chat with Bronnie Thompson, who is a New Zealand occupational therapist. Bronnie is a trailblazer in the research area of can we live well with chronic pain? And it's something that really fascinates me because the nature of pain and the, the sort of definition of the experience of pain is that it's unpleasant and it infringes and impinges upon valued activity. So how on earth can you live well with persistent or chronic pain? So Bronny actually has done a PhD on this and written extensively in this area, looking at various traits and things that people do who have chronic pain to allow them to live a fulfilled life. It's a really fascinating insight. Bronnie also challenges this notion of exercise in managing somebody with pain. And I really encourage you to listen to what she says in regards to this very important topic. Thanks so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Bronnie Thompson. Cheers. Okay, here we are with Bronnie, Dr. Bronnie Thompson, I should say. Oh, I, don't, I don't know if that's the terminology you like to go by. Um, Sometimes <laughs> I have got I have a PhD, so that's yeah. you know, but normally Thompson, I don't PhD. Use, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So we are we're going to chat about all sorts of different things. Bronnie is somebody who I always read um, all everything she publishes. Just about I'm certainly always reading her blog as well, and always presenting a challenging uh, point and a thought provoking point in regards to pain, especially in. And for me, I, I know your work as it sort of relates to uh, your fabulous paper of living well with chronic pain. And that's where I first started to, to read all of your stuff. And it's really informed my practice quite a lot wow. and forced me to look at my own biases, which is which we often don't want to do, but we wow. need to do. So, so mm. thanks for that. Um, before, we, before we get involved with, with the, the deep academic and research stuff, <laughs> I just want to know a little bit about you, Bronnie, and... and a bit of your background because I know you're an occupational therapist I'm a physio so a little bit different um, but I hope there's some overlapping uh, qualities that we share and also a bit of a brief history about you and and how you ended up in the position you are. Alrighty. um so who am I? Uh, I'm a 56 year old woman in New Zealand <laughs> um, and I currently work as mainly academic so I mainly teach a little bit of research when I can do that, um, and a little bit of clinical work, probably not nearly enough, really, but, um, but that's the way things are at the moment. And I have worked in pain management since probably oh, the late 80s, I suppose. Um, so my background's occupational therapy, and then I've also got a master's in psychology, and then I went on to do my PhD um, looking at people who live well with pain. And so my kind of orientation, partly personally, because I live with fibromyalgia, but also because of the people that I've worked with is, is practical. How can we help people live the lives that they want to live? Mm. That's really where I'm coming from. Outside of that, um, I do all sorts of weird and wacky things. Like I fish, I look for trout, um, and I kayak in our wonderful high country lakes, and I have a zany labradoodle who is a, she's large, and she's very enthusiastic. You may hear her doing things. We'll see, we'll see what happens with that. Um, and what else do I do? I silversmith, so that's my, my key way of not thinking words. Cool. I listen to classic rock and jazz, and I hammer silver. It's awesome. <laughs> Love it. That's yeah. that's cool. That's um, yeah. that's some interesting hobbies that you that you have. How did you get? To, so oh. fishing is a classic New Zealand pastime, isn't it? Oh, it's wonderful. So, mm. so post PhD, um, my partner and I were looking at what can we do that gets us both out into mm. our wonderful nature. That so he's a he's fit as a buck rat, and he likes to climb up hills, and I don't. I like the flat. And I like my rivers. And so we decided, what can we do together 
we're, we're both outside and enjoying that, but we're not trying to catch up with one another. And so we decided to learn how to fish. Mm. And we both, because we both used to dive, did scuba. Um, I got concussed and now I throw up when I'm underwater. It's not good. It's just really, or really horrible. So don't do that. Um, so we decided we learn how to fish. And so we do. And it's just, oh, it's awesome. It's just wonderful. It's, Bronnie, it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not the catching. <laughs> It's the standing there, being mindful in this mm. beautiful setting mm. with the water flowing by. Um, if it's raining, I don't care. I, I don't want to be there. But if it's a beautiful day, or you're paddling around this pristine lake, mm. and, and then you just, every now and then, it's like the gambler's high. All of a sudden, you get the tug on the line, and it's all on. So, oh, that's wonderful. And then we, then we release them. Mm. We, don't cool. use, we don't eat them <laughs> yeah the this the scenery you've got over there in new zealand is Stunning. it's second to none i think are you, are you in the south or the north island yeah 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 so cool. what you can see behind me is um mm. on the on one of our rivers there's a there's a flat area and we go out towards the coast and the beach is on just about 200 meters from the end of that Mm. And that's one of the beaches that we just spend most of our time in. Um, it's got a place called Nappy Nappy, which is people from not from New Zealand will laugh at it and think, Nappy Nappy. <laughs> but it's, um, it's a beautiful beach. It's just lovely. So, yeah, we've got the whole of the South Island to play with because there's no yeah. tourists. True. That's which awesome. It's nice, actually. Yeah. <laughs> one of the perks to a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah. One of the few. We've exactly. got very many. Let's take yeah. what we've got, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so describe a normal week, Bronnie. So what, what, what occupies you in a week from a work perspective? Um, so I work seven tenths, so three and a half days in academia. Um, and I also, so on a Monday, I'll, I'll write my blog. And that's not related to my academic work. That's my way of processing things that are happening in the pain management world. And... I guess working through ideas in my head and conveying them because I think as I construct um, a paper, I'm actually creating my, I'm constructing my opinion and synthesizing and hopefully, hopefully getting things that are in journals out into where they're accessible because that, mm. that irks me. So that's my spare time. Um, and then I usually, I work from home a lot because I share an office and trying to do stats or read complex texts or do any analysis or write when you've got conversations going on in the environment it's really difficult so um so under lockdown it really didn't change my lifestyle very much so tuesdays is, is a reading half day wednesdays i usually go into the office and spend my day um, doing the admin work. So I'm the academic coordinator for our post-grad program in pain and pain management. And so that means um, student ad ad admissions, um, just, the, you know, university administration. Mm. We've got to remember this is a medieval institution. It has been around since forever. So bureaucracy originated in the university, I swear. <laughs> We're very good at it. <laughs> Um, and then I, I teach on Thursday evening, so all of our teaching is online, um, and so I'm doing a lot of that. I teach postgrads, and I teach um, fifth-year medical students, and I do some ad hoc teaching and nursing, postgrad nursing, and um, other courses, just as, as needed or as requested. But most of my teaching is um, postgrad, which is an absolute delight. We have um, the most broad range of health professionals all geekily interested in pain what more could a woman ask for to yeah. have inquiring minds um and then i try to spend my fridays doing meetings and writing um, and trying to read stuff you know i thought when i went into academic work I had this vision of sitting in a cafe, reading papers and proclaiming, well, you don't get time. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so that was what you do during the PhD. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore. It's, life's a lot different. 
Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Yeah. So that's that's cool. So you kind of you, you you set aside that Monday for the blog as a sort of creative enterprise to. Um. Yeah, kind that's, of creative. It's it's partly. Um, I need sort of brain space where I mm. don't have obligations just to process what I've been reading and mm. the discourse that's happening on social media. Um, mm. Because though social media doesn't represent all clinicians, it's one way where clinician voices can be heard. Mm. And in academia, you may not actually spend time with practicing clinicians. So it's not always easy to understand what it's like. And I do a little bit of clinical work, but, um, but it's quite contained. And what I'm hearing on social media are the, the actual debates and discussions and the reality of how difficult it is to um, critically appraise material that's spread around and to think about how do I do this in my context. Research environments are so different from actual clinical practice. So that's what I do in that time. Mm. Um, just muddle my way through thinking through that sort of stuff. And then when I'm not doing that, I, I've got a client I see regularly and so I'll go and spend some time with her and I'll, I'll do some silversmithing just to get my head clear of the pressure of what we do in our, in our teaching, which is so word dense. Mm. Like there's so many words and th thoughts and concepts that we try to process that I like that space not to think words. Yeah. So yeah, no, I'm with you. So so important. It's uh, can it can be all consuming and mm. often go to bed sometimes thinking about silly things to do with work when you just want to yep. want to switch off. So it's important to have that that release, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, what about okay? So another this is one of my favorite questions. So, what TV series or book are you reading or watching at the yep. moment? And tell me a little bit about it. Um, so I don't watch much TV at all or Netflix or anything. And that's because I live with an outdoorsy man who likes to watch hunting programs. You know, I can't mm. have two, two things going on at once. Mm. So I read junk science fiction and fantasy. Absolute trash. But the book that I've been reading, I have to get her name out because it's actually really important. Mm. Um, she's fantastic. Speculative um, fiction is, I guess, what you could call it. Okay. Let me just, where is it? Kindle. I'll find it. No, you're out. Ah, should be able to find it. Um, Because I just sent myself a, a notice about a quote from, um, from this woman. I'll have to do it a different way, sorry. <laughs> uh, just hold on a sec. Because she, she writes beautifully. Yeah. Um, she is so, um, here we go, uh, Becky Chambers, and the series that I've been reading is called Wayfarers, mm. um, and it's really a mm, futuristic depiction of what happens when humans can't live on the planet and create a self-sustaining um, life aboard vessels that's mm. supposed to be on their way to going somewhere but they got somewhere and then not everybody left to go onto planet and sort of thinking about how systems don't remain static mm. people don't remain static and we try to preserve history as a record of what's been and that can sometimes lock us into um, trying to emulate that same sameness but actually it doesn't work so it's a lot of talk about entropy and human attitudes towards, well, parallels are towards people who are different. She talks a lot about the type of um, assumptions that different people have about um, aliens in her case, but also the, the way that values can be expressed differently, but ultimately they're really the same. So what I like about um, her writing is how intelligently written it is because I've re read some really trashy science fiction that is awful. Bring back Ian Banks, bring back the, <laughs> the best writers, you know? Let's get them back because they, um, because there is a lot of 
pulp fiction out there and mm. um, the real true science fiction writers make us think differently mm. they pro prod us in a wonderful way just to parcel aside our usual preconceptions and say i wonder what would happen if mm. i like that opportunity it's it, that's i'm reading it i'm fascinated by like early 20th century physics some somehow and um <laughs> I won't there's, ask why. <laughs> there's, a, there's an author hg wells yes pretty famous obviously he he predicted the atomic bomb like 50 years before it even happened even before we knew we could split the atom yeah so this is this is the fascinating part about science fiction writers they're so like they preemptive and, and intelligent yeah. it's, it's amazing it's like the jetsons the jetsons mm. had videos hey what are mm. we doing that's right mm. we're using video and it was mm. thought that was just the way it is and mm. to imagine the possibilities um i think is something useful for us it's, mm. it can be dystopian this is how it's going to be if all things fail or it can be really mm. positive mm. um and make us anticipate that we could do things differently mm. which i think is really a good thing for us as humans we've got imagination we should use them <laughs> Bloody hope. yeah 100 percent. and that's that's probably that's so so you've got the rigid academic work and then you can let your mind wander with some of this reading it's a good combination well our academic work and inquiry and research is mm. a creative process and I mm. think that we forget that mm. and sometimes we even forget that our clinical practice is a creative process and I think what I find really healthy about say silversmithing is that I'm looking at this flat piece of silver mm. and I can springboard off ideas that I've had from completely different things and express that in a piece of silver so it helps me, and, and in clinic, that's what we're doing as well. We've got this person who presents in one way, and we're thinking creatively about how can I help create some change or support some change or disturb this um, system that might be stuck so that change can happen. And that's, mm. um, that's a creative process. Mm. When we get into formulas, then I think we lose that responsivity that we need. Humans aren't very straightforward, really. What do you mean we can't just give a recipe approach to everybody and they're all going to get better? Three then? times ten. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you mean, no, I'm not. I'm not starting yet. <laughs> it could <All> happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so we know we know who you are now. You're a 56 year old New Zealand woman who yep. silversmiths, reads science fiction novels, occupational therapist by background. Yep. And so, what I suggested at the start of this, or what I what I said at the start, was that I first came across your work with this "Living Well with Chronic Pain," and it's a fantastic title, actually, as well. And because it, it's kind of, it's it's it, it's jolting from the start because the concept of living well with chronic pain, it seems like an oxymoron. That. It seems yeah. conflicting. How how can you live well with pain? Um, so that that really got my attention, and then and then it was a it was a really well thought out paper as well so so congrats on that thank you um could you could you tell us a bit about it how can you yeah. how possibly can you live well with pain the definition of pain is that it is unpleasant and it infringes and impinges upon our life how, how can that how can we resolve that to live well with it or or sort of persist with it it's um so the backstory to this to why i chose to do this as a phd because this is my phd um research was that I live with a man who has ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and I have my fibro. And so, and we think we live really well. And with Bo's um, ankle spond, he had a period of time when it was really out of control, really high levels of inflammation and really couldn't move well. To the point, I've said this in a number of presentations, where we, we had to use a rolling a sliding sheet to roll over at night because it grabs them in his intercostals and he couldn't cough and he couldn't take deep breaths and he couldn't roll over. And yet he's worked all the way through. He at the time was a high country firefighter in his spare time. He likes to go hunting, tramping, carrying a whacking great pack on his back. Um, he's never, he's, he's always been fit. You know, his favourite thing is to climb up the top of a hill and look out. And so I couldn't reconcile that with the stories that I continually hear 
when I, um, at that time I was working clinically at a chronic pain service, where people were saying, this is just eating up my life. I'm not who, who I was. You know, I, I don't know who I am anymore. And I couldn't reconcile how, how there is this disparity. How is it that some people, like my partner, can carry on? And you could, you could explore this by trying to compare people. So we'll have people who cope well and people who don't cope well, and let's have a look at the differences between them. But when you do that, you're making some big assumptions about what might be important. And if you have a look for literature on people who cope well, there is very little there. Especially at the time I started looking at this, which was about the early 2000s, um, when I started thinking around this area. Uh, and there were very few papers published. And so I didn't know. There were assumptions that if that somebody who's coping well might be the inverse of somebody who's not coping well. So all the things that somebody who's not coping, you know, the things that we know contribute to poor coping, maybe they'll be the thing, the opposite of that will be applicable in these people. And I thought, hmm, okay. That's a huge lot of assumptions to make. And I'm not sure about that. So I thought I'm a bit of a philosophy of science nerd. And I really like the, the in, when, we're, when we're doing research, we often kind of think about a hypothesis just suddenly pops in, fully formed, and then we go test it. But what that process of science making forgets and, and, and leaves out is that preliminary process. How do we know, how do we generate that interesting hypothesis? And yes, you can look for gaps in the literature, but if you haven't got a literature and there wasn't for people with, um, with, who live well with pain, then how do you come up with a, a hypothesis to test? So I thought, well, let's do some observations. Let's look for what we can call an empirical regularity. So we know that there are about 15%, um, 15 to 20% of people who have persistent pain who actually say, I'm living really well. Um, they have low distress, low interference, but they have moderate to severe pain. And this comes from a paper... Um, that I read, I think it's from 2016, it might be a little bit um, older than that, from Carolee and Ruhlman, who developed a measure of, of chronic pain um, that looked at these three constructs and found that, yes, there are these, these people that, that are out there and we don't know much about them. So I looked at that and thought, why don't we start talking to these people? And grounded theory is one way of being able to not just describe, but to step back from that and to start to categorize processes that people engage in as they do, as they become this person that lives well and generate a theory that can then be tested. So I chose to do that. It was fun, it was exciting, um, and I still relish the process because all our clinical work is done with people who say, I'm not managing this, I need help. I had the joy of talking to people who said, well, actually, listen to what I'm doing. And by the way, I've got pain. So what, what seemed to happen was that um, the whole overall process is how can I be me, really? Um, reoccupying my sense of who I am. Because when pain happens, it's described quite often in um, qualitative literature as a, a disruption to a biographical sense of self. The person that I am, the things that I assume I can do, um, fall over. I'm no longer able to sleep. I can't go um, fishing because my shoulder hurts, or I can't go walking, or I can't work. Or if I work, I'm not the kind of worker I used to be. So there's a whole stack of losses. So what I found was that the overarching process is how can I be me? And there are three bits to that. The first part's um, how can I make sense of this thing that's going on for me? Um, 
what what does it look like? What's the name for it? So I talked about naming it. Um, naming it is, is the process of getting a, a, a label or a diagnosis. And for all that I'm not, I don't use diagnoses in the work that I do, a diagnosis has a function. And what it is, is it's a shorthand way of saying, this is what's wrong with me, that everybody else seems to understand. So if I say I've got fibromyalgia, you may have an understanding of really what that looks like from some perspectives. You don't get the whole picture, you just get this little bit. But to someone with pain, it means that this is something that we know exists. It's not a mystery anymore. It's a real thing. Somebody understands that it is a problem. That acknowledgement's a really important part. It's an almost a validation. Yeah, it is a validation. It's a, um, this doesn't, you don't have to be so scared of it. It, you can, it's a known entity um, and I was struck by the way that that sense of uncertainty until a label has been given is really freaking it really freaks people out so even if we construct a label like we construct it as a um, fibromyalgia is a really good word for example we, we can call it a whole bunch of stuff this person's got widespread pain we've chosen to call it fibromyalgia but before that it was known by a whole lot of other names so it is a construct and i think we need to remember that about diagnosis that it's a social construct something that people make and we impose order and we assume that underneath that that label is some kind of organizing principle but actually mm. it's not actually that straightforward it's not a fundamental law of nature, is it? It's not. And Everything we, else is a concept. Yeah, we put, it, we put it on there. And yet in social terms, and the way we interact with people, being able to share a language that says, oh, I know what osteoarthritis is, or I know what ankylosing spondylitis is, helps to give some expectations around what might need to be done, what my future might be, um, that other people can understand. And for pain in particular, that seems to be really important because pain's invisible. So part of the first part of making sense is to get, get a name for it. The second part is to work out, well, what does that mean in terms of what I can and can't do? What's the daily life impact? This is the bit that we don't do very well. We don't support people through very well. We tend to think that when someone comes to see us with their pain, that they already know what sets their pain off, what settles it down, that they already know how much they can and can't do. And in this first phase of living with pain, people are still testing out the boundaries. So they, at the end of this part of this process is the, is the sense that, so if my pain's at this today, I can expect myself to do that. So it's about predicting how much I can do um, if I don't want to flare my pain up. And, you know, if I don't have pain today, um, this means I can do this. And so it's a common sense, sense making of the impact of pain. And throughout this period of making sense, there's people are only able to focus on what helps them exist in day-to-day -day life. So that process of existing is, how do I get to sleep? How do I stay in my job? How do I keep things stable while I'm making sense? Um, and sometimes as clinicians, we want to help the person make changes and we ask them, what do you want to be able to do in the future? And they're sort of thinking, oh, hold on. I'm still making sense of this thing. I don't know what it's gonna be. So sometimes I think we can jump ahead. Mm. Then at some point in this period, there's a point where this group of people said, if, if this is the way it is, then I'm just going to have to get on with it, which I've called deciding, because, you know, really good, easy, easy label. And that was driven by two things. One was that they had a relationship at some point during that making sense phase with somebody that I've called a trustworthy clinician. That person who did little extra steps to say, you matter, I'm going to individualize. I'm going to look out for something for you. 
as an individual. I might give you a call to say, hey, how did you go with that exercise? Or um, I might give out some, so a handout and say, how was looking on the internet? And, oh, I found this and it reminded me of you. Something that shows to the person that they're not just a number. They're not the same as everybody else. So it's not just person-centered care. It's actually stepping a little bit beyond that into taking that little extra individualizing step. Um, and these, these clinicians were all so permissive and that they stood by the person to say, you, you go try some stuff out. I'll be here. I'll stand by you. I'll wave the flag and I'll be on your side. They didn't be toe trying stuff out. And that person, in con conjunction with the other part, which was, which was the desire to do something that mattered to people. I've called it occupational drive because I'm an OT, and occupation is about all those things that people do in daily life that matter to them. And um, we could call them valued activities if you want, but they're the things that um, being a parent, being a rugby player, being a fisherman, um, being a dancer, being an independent person, these things that um, drive us to engage in things that matter to us. So when you have a, somebody who's prepared to stand by you and wave the flag and say, I'm here for you, and by the way, this little thing I found might help you, and you've got that drive to do what makes you feel like yourself, these people, after they'd made sense, could move into the last phase, which is where I've called it flexibly persisting, which is looking at, this is the direction I want to go in, but I might have to take some devious routes to get there, but I'm going to move in that direction anyway. And that was made up of engaging with doing, again, so beginning to do stuff that didn't look exactly the same as the old way of doing it, but it still tapped into the meaning. So my rugby bloke wanted to still be involved with rugby. So for him, occupational engaging was going back to the rugby um, club and meeting up with his mates. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> that was helping to connect him back into that part of his self-identity that mattered. Um, and then in that process, it was through doing those things that matter that coping strategies were identified and used and developed. It's like they didn't develop the skills first and then do. They did and looked for ways that they could get to do those things in the way they wanted to. Mm. That was about developing those strategies. And inside that strategy, I found some three really important groups. One was... Um, non-judgmental awareness so I notice what my pain's doing on a day-to-day -day basis it doesn't mean I'm going to stop but I take it into account and I think sometimes the way that persistent pain management has been driven is almost like pretend you don't have it just put it over there and pretend and just carry on as if you're normal well that's ridiculous pain is is for me it's there all the time. And when I'm having a, a bit of a flare up, and I have been the last few weeks, I do need to account for that and what I expect from myself. I don't stop, but I do have to accommodate it. Um, and so these people are saying, well, I just notice that, yeah, today's a bad pain day and I'll change my expectations and I'll accommodate it. Or one woman was saying, well, look, what does it matter if, I do my face-to-face -face work in the morning when I'm feeling better and do my sort of non-face-to-face -face discretional and relaxation stuff in the afternoon when I'm not feeling so good. I'm getting stuff done. I thought that was, that was, that was kind of to me, oh, oh can't do that. Because mm -hmm. that's not what we were trained in um, pain management to do. We taught, we've always talked about pacing and not booming and busting. And here she was, merrily booming and busting and finding it worked really well for her. Mm -hmm. So that, that sort of that noticing. And the second coping strategy that they all did, you will laugh, was all about movement. 
It was all about exercise, damn it. Um, but it was not exercise because I want to get strong, because I want to correct something, because I want to increase my cardiovascular capacity. It was because it gives me headspace. Because I can, can do this walk to work and my mind gets some time to think. Mm. Um, I can jump on the, um, on the bike and go cycle to and from work and I'm able to let go of stuff. So it was used more as a mindfulness opportunity almost or a decompression opportunity. But also, um, in New Zealand we have um, John Kerwin famous rugby player, you know, yeah. um, and he is the spokesman for um, depression.org. He's been fabulous in terms of talking about his own experience with depression. One of the ads that um, he's been in has said, I always do exercise because it just makes me feel better. And that exercise form doesn't, isn't as relevant as I'm moving and I feel better. And that's what these people were talking about I'm moving and it feels better and that could be walking the dog it could be swimming it could be gardening it could be whatever the people really wanted to do that performed the function of I'm um, I've got things I can spend my head headspace in and then the last group was a hodgepodge of whatever works and by by that I mean whatever works for that person so people would pick up the most weird and wonderful Things, including coloured lights. I'll sit under my coloured lights for half an hour um, for one of my blokes. Um, doesn't do anything as far as I know, but for him, it fitted for him. And I guess what I have discovered from the coping strategies that people describe, I'd been expecting good copers, people who think that they're living well, would do the things that we expect from people who are doing pain management. They'd be pacing, they'd be exercising, they'd be planning, they'd be um, using positive self-statements, they'd be using mindfulness bar right? Well, not. Actually, mm. they will use whatever fits. And anytime something new comes out, these guys will evaluate, will that fit into my life? And then they'll pick up and use that. If it fits, but not mm. if it doesn't. Or they'll pick up a bit of it that fits. And then the last part of this sort of final flexibly persisting is that it's, the, it's only really at this point that people are able to think of the future. And they can start this future planning, thinking about, so now, now that I kind of got a handle on this, I could think about my trip to Australia or I can plan to go out on a Friday night because I know what I can expect. And that's not present in people in that earlier phase. Mm. This wasn't set over a particular time. The people that I talked to had pain that ranged from a year to 30 years. Um, so it was quite variable. It wasn't short term though. I don't think this process is a short term process. I think it takes time for people to figure out how can I express who I am, which involves letting go of previous expectations about what kind of a worker you are, for example. Mm. Um, what kind of a mother you're going to be or a fisher person or a rugby player and then to pick up new ways of expressing that mm. um, so it's quite a yeah it was it was an enlightening experience um, challenged me a lot mm. yeah that's Ronnie there's too many things to talk about I've written <laughs> sorry I've scribbled, <laughs> I've scribbled all over your uh, your research paper here um, uh, I want to I want <laughs> So that just that brings up a quote that I think I read from your paper was was it that your body may change but yourself remains. I think I got that from you or some or maybe Carolee's paper. But anyway, it's a yeah. absolutely that, that sort of floored me when I when I read that and I try and you don't you don't speak in quotes to your patients, but it's a very interesting way of yeah. trying to hit home or, or emphasize their identity and perhaps yeah. you still can have that identity even with these changes in your body. Even if you express it differently. Exactly. I look at it, so if we think about, um, I often work with blokes. I don't know why, but I end up doing it. And, and often they say, well, I want to be a really good dad. And what does 
being a good dad look like? Well, probably for most blokes, it'll be playing rough and tumble, going to sports, doing doing that kind of stuff with, with their lads or lassies. And for most people with persistent pain, that has to change in form. Mm. So how else can you express being a wonderful dad? Loads and loads of different ways. And for people who have got stuck that the only way I can be a good father is by playing rough and tumble and I can't do that, then they lose that sense of, I'm, they start to say, well, I'm not a good father. And yet we can help loosen that, that belief that there's only one way to be a good dad and create this wonderfully rich example of the other ways that you can be that person that you want to be. And that's the creative part of being a clinician, thinking, so like my racing car driver, who, you know, how can he be a really good racing truck car driver? He's been a bit of a blimp when he was growing up with juvenile arthritis. Um, he decided I need to get fit. If I want to be a racing car driver, I'm going to get fit. So he goes to the gym and here's a guy who hated phys ed, would, would try to avoid it and hide behind the bike sheds. There he is, going to the gym for three hours. You know, that's pretty cool. Mm. So we can do things that matter if they're helping to build that sort of sense of who I am and even if it increases pain. So I want to um, sort of talk a little bit about that because so I said I work, work with motorcyclists and I don't know a motorcyclist who hasn't told me that in a bit of a guilty shame-faced way oh yeah I went out on the bike oh it was wonderful but boy do I hurt and then you say was it worth it and they say, yeah. The motorcycle, I'm an ex-motorcyclist. Um, and it's about that sense of being at one with the machine, taking through the roads, going through the curves, and just absolutely loving it. And these guys have got this sense that if that they shouldn't do it because it'll increase their pain. Um, and that's because people have said, you know, pain's the most important thing. If we can relax that a little bit. It's okay to experience pain if it's doing something that matters to you. And that's what these guys in this study were saying. Yeah, um, going back to playing rugby for one of my participants really hurt. Um, it, it, yes, he started by just meeting up with the blokes at the club and then he started bringing the oranges at half time, as people do. And then he started coaching and then he started being a line ref. And then he started to go back into Masters Rugby. And that took a, a while, but it hurt. But he said it's worth it, because that is about feeding his soul. <laughs> you know, it makes him feel like himself again. Mm. And I sometimes think when we're looking at um, rehabilitation with people that we, we forget that they want a life. They don't want to have a recipe or a, um, a series of goals that they have to tick off each day. It's not what life is about. Life's more free-flowing. Um, and sometimes we think, well, you've got to do your 30 minutes of exercise and do your three times 10. And maybe that doesn't fit. Maybe there are other ways to do that that are more life-like mm -hmm. for this person. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hard for us. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. Mm. Um, can, we, can I just go back to the sort of the sense-making aspect of the theory. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that a diagnosis is important mm. or a label or a name, which, whichever yeah. way you want to look at it. Yeah. How, how does that relate to a pathoanatomical diagnosis that may be challenged? And so let's say sciatica and, yeah. and it's not, perhaps not correct their interpretation of it and we want to yeah. say non-specific low back pain or something like that. So would you just allow that without challenging or having a discussion about the inaccuracy of the term perhaps? Or would you say, look, this is serving a purpose, that person feels in control with that diagnosis, and mm. then you sort of just go on and, and, and say, yeah, you've got sciatica, but it's not gonna infringe upon activities that you wanna do. How would you approach um, that? Well, I think we've got, we've got terms that acquire meaning, even if we've got a proper name for it. They will, it will acquire meaning over time. So I look at, it, at its utility very much more. It is confusing for patients 
um, to be given multiple names for essentially their, their personal experience. Um, and working in chronic pain management as I have, you'll see people with you know, five or six different diagnostic labels for the same thing. Mm. And that's really confusing. So I think people like a label that is in common use because it's what they're going to say to um, their employer. It's what they're going to say to Auntie Mabel down the road. It's what they're going to talk about to their mates and their, and their neighbours, as well as when they go to see the net clinician. Hopefully they won't need to see too many, but, you know, they will. Um, and I guess what I would look at is what's it, What's the function? How well is this working for this person? Labels acquire good and not so good attributes. Fibromyalgia is a really good example of that where it can be seen as a wishy-washy basket case label. Everything gets thrown in there. Or it can be seen as an identifier that maybe we don't really know what's going on here, but it's widespread pain. Um, and we know from sociology that when people collect together under that label of fibromyalgia, there are both good and not so good elements of that as well. Um, some people say it's liberating. Yay, I know it's not a dreadful disease. Others say, oh, it's awful. We're gonna have, I'm going to have all of these symptoms. So it's not so much the word, it's the meaning that person takes from that word. So I like a nice convenient conversation with the person, a nice label that makes it easy for them to communicate what that means. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's just useful to, for us as clinicians to think about, if I give this person a new label, what, who is that satisfying? Mm. Is it satisfying me because I like to have an algorithm? Is it a satisfying um, an insurer who might now pay for something? or Conversely, this person could lose their compensation and their cover as a result, mm. or is it for some other purpose? Um, if we're here to serve the people that we are treating, then we need to think about it from their perspective. So what sense do they make of being told there's another label for what you've mm. got? Mm. Um, so I try, yeah. clinically I don't use it, I mm. try not to, I just say you've got pain, mm. and then we do a formulation, but but the literature is pretty clear that people want to know what it's called. And Leventhal's common sense model talks about this. He's a, got a lovely model of, of illness, and it's about what we think this title represents. The prognosis might be what the illness re beliefs are around this. If you've got a cold, you know, you know it's going to last about a week. You're probably not going to die from it. Now with the same symptoms, cough, feeling ill, we might be worrying about what else that might mean. And that means that we, the illness model that we've got of what it looks like to have a cold has got threatened and it's mm. got changed. It's changed. And that, that applies to back pain really well. Mm. You know, how many different words do we have for back pain? Mm. Um, lumbago might be the best one. Mm. Oh, you got a touch of lumbago. <laughs> <laughs> it's just—it's so true. It's um, where 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 I think a diagnosis or accuracy of diagnosis is important, though, when it's when it's this fundamentally mechanical diagnosis, and the person interprets it to to the letter. You know, so for example, subacromial impingement, which is a term that I hate. Somebody. Yep somebody's like it's pinch there's a bone rubbing on my tendon whenever i elevate my arm i don't look, want to elevate my arm <laughs> exactly right look yep. there's a bone spur coming down yeah and so for me that that's something that we have to change because i think that interpretation sets us sets that condition up to be managed in a certain way meaning you have to de-impinge the shoulder which, which yep. is incorrect so so Needs perhaps when, usually yeah, precisely yeah. or an injection or some form yeah. of other medical management so I think when, when the way we speak about a condition sets it up to be managed in a very perhaps surgical or interventional manner, a conversation may be oh, worthwhile there. Yeah. I still think that that's about the way that the person interprets the 100%. use of that. But for clinicians, we, we buy into these terms mm. big time. It, it does shape 
perhaps less so for occupational therapists because we are not dealing with the impairment. We're dealing with the function and participation if we're looking mm -hmm. at an ICF model. Um, but we do, we are informed by that. So our, we, that shapes, that diagnostic label shapes our expectations as it does to everybody. What, mm -hmm. can, what do we think needs to be done? What do we think the prognosis might be? What are the things we must not do? Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of a painful problem, we do have some problems there because how many names do we have for lateral elbow pain? Yeah. Yeah. And can we not just call it lateral elbow pain and be done yeah. with it? Yeah. And I have, I have an impingement in my shoulder. Mm. I know, because I've seen the image <laughs> and it shows that. Yeah. But, you know, what, does, what difference does mm. it actually make mm. from a practical sense? Exactly. Think, You've got yeah, shoulder pain. Yeah, I've got shoulder pain. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't prune the wisteria in one go. Just take it yeah. a little bit quietly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 100%. And that, so for me, I, I sort of work in a tertiary referral center for, for yeah. chronic shoulder pain issues. And the amount of biomechanical jargon that these people have been told to within it. an inch of the, like, like it's just, it's there's so many barriers to um, unpacking that and you need to be careful and to, I don't want to take away that whole person's understanding of their condition yeah. in one fell swoop, you yeah. know? So, but, but I think we need to, when I say we, us as sort of um, non-surgical or non-medical people, allied health people need to discuss. And I do this regularly with GPs and orthopedic surgeons and sports physicians and all of these lovely people yeah, we need to have some form of consensus with how we're what we're calling conditions and how how we manage it. I just don't know if Good we're luck. ever going to get there. I don't, exactly, there's yeah. far too many vested so interests. So many different voices um, mm. around it, depending on the slice that they're taking through the problem. Mm. And ultimately, the person themselves is going to make some sense out of all of this mess that they've been told. Mm. And I guess that's why I quite like the guiding through. What do you think? this means what's your theory yeah. about what's happening and how do you know this and how can we challenge that or test that out can mm. we try some experiments to see whether your assumptions about what's going on based on what you've been told by all of these people you've seen does that do those assumptions hold and that's that's where our clinical practice starts to become most useful where we're on a journey of discovery together as a guided discovery. Um, and, you know, psychology does this with mental illness very often. We can do the same with pain. Mm. So you've got an impingement. So I wonder what that means if you try this. Exactly. You know? yeah. Yeah. So we're getting, that's beautiful because that's on it. That's kind of like cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive yep. functional therapy, yep. Peter O'Sullivan stuff. And that's exactly that they have a cognition or a belief in a certain yep. issue. And then we're like, well, let's give it a go. We can What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and I like that journey of discovery together because actually I don't know mm. what will happen. Mm. And that's really useful for, for us both because we can mm. do this low-risk, playful approach to doing mm. a movement that in a context, because context matters, mm. um, that involves... Yeah, the playfulness takes that stress away from, I've got to do these exercises so I get better. Instead, I'm discovering, oh, what can I try with this? Um, and I think that's fun and lightens up our clinical work. Otherwise, mm. we start trying to take over the um, and prescribe and get frustrated when it doesn't work. And often it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, I know that all too well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So the last, the last topic that I really want to talk about is you've been vocal recently on this topic of exercise, um, and I'm going to I'll use inverted commas with exercise. Yeah. Perhaps you have another alternative. Um, so what? So exercise has exploded recently. I think in terms of um, it's a tonic for everything. It resolves everything from chronic disease to mental health conditions to pain to everything it's a poly pill yep. which may it's, which may not be wrong it certainly can affect multi systems in a positive manner 
Um, but whether we just need to use it like a blunt tool, a blunt instrument for everybody. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exercise. Ex <laughs> exercise. Yeah. The World yeah. Health Organization says this amount of exercise per yeah. week. So, so I guess just tell me why you have a bit of a gripe with this concept of exercise and, and how can we maybe think yeah. about it from a more nuanced manner? So when I say exercise to patients, um, particularly people who are struggling with their pain, they kind of, you have two re reactions. One is the gym person who, yay, I'm going to get back and do some stuff. The other is the frightened rabbit or frightened possum in the headlights look. Like, oh my God. Um, where the physio terrorist has terrorized them <laughs> into doing stuff that they're not ready for, or that has been boring, or that they've been prescribed, never reviewed, and then as soon as that program finishes, they drop like a hot potato. What is the point? Mm -hmm. If we're really about helping people live a good life, movement is inherent to human beings. We've got to do it. We're not made to sit still, ever. And, and here am I sitting still, but, but as you can tell, I don't sit very still, right? I wriggle all the time, that's me. Um, but so what we, I think what we need to recognize is that in an evolutionary terms, we were never designed to sit still, but neither were we designed to go lift heavy weights in the gym. We were never designed to do that. We were designed to have lots of variety. To, in fact, we are the Swiss army knife of, of animals. We're not very good at anything, particularly. We're really good at everything. We have lots of options. And when we think about movement, I think we've wanted to put it into one frame and movement looks like this. When I look at the pre-history people, pre-written history people, and the variety of things that people do in tribal culture, it's physical. You dig, you pound, you grind, you, you shake, you, you have to create these things. And that's all done in daily life. And we tend not to do that as much because we're sitting behind, especially clerical workers, academics, whatever, sitting behind a computer. So we're not getting enough movement variety in our lives anyway. Now, movement variety and intensity are both important. You've got to have enough intensity to keep your tissues healthy. That's, that's a given. But we don't really know what the best way of doing that is for somebody. And what I object to is some young, fit person assuming that this person in front of them, me, pick on me, wants to and needs to do it the way that they find meaningful. So this young buck might really love to go running and expect that I, who absolutely loathe running, will do it because it feels good to them. And there's this like mystified look if I say, oh, actually, I don't really like doing that. Um, what I like doing is carrying my fishing rod and going for a long walk along the riverbank, which involves boulder hopping, lots of balance. Usually it fall, involves getting into the water and walking against the current. You know, that is exercise. Um, and I'll do that one day and I'll do something else another day. I'll garden, I'll prune the wisteria, <laughs> I'll do my housework. And all of these things are they're optimistic ways of viewing the way that humans can move. Then we're not restricted to the ideals that we expect from people. And the advert that they used in, in New Zealand was 30 minutes to push play. And I like that. So, okay, 30 minutes is probably not enough. But if we want to start, we want to start somewhere. And what about using physical play as a way of getting people into, into actually enjoying this process and it's meaningful. So you can do play by throwing a frisbee around. You can do play by jumping in a kayak and going fishing. You can do play by, um, I don't know, kicking a ball around for the dog. So many options. Let's not just get stuck into three sets of 10. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. awful. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's fun. <laughs> We've got yeah, to be more intelligent than that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I dance, and dance to me is as essential as, I don't know, other people find running. 
dance is also a form of movement. Mm. But I, you know, we don't expect in, um, if we look at tribal groups, we don't see them doing the same thing every day. They have variety. And we expect people to have this gym program that they follow every day. Instead of saying, today I, I can have this choice from five different activities, all that involve this rich diversity of movement and context. And that's important for adapt adaptation, for variability, for flexibility, for strength. We need all of that. Mm. Um, and sticking to proper form, doing biceps curls, I mean, come on. Yeah, no, mo movement variability is, is everything. Like you, if, 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 the, if, a, if a biological system is comfortable moving in all sorts of directions, with all sorts of loads, at all sorts of intensities, but with all sorts of contexts, yeah. Yeah. I think that is the most advantageous from an evolutionary perspective yeah. of an organism to live. And that's and, really what we're trying to do for people. And what, we, what we're doing is, is movement people. Is we've got somebody who's not moving very much because of pain so we start small but if we only introduce them to stuff that is very constrained mm -hmm. and then they go off into the wild after we've done our thing what repertoire of movement do they have for themselves later mm -hmm. because our bodies are constantly changing we're aging we've got different things that are happening to us in different environments that we're in if we don't teach people that they can use anything in their world to create a movement opportunity, then we're missing out on this most incredible opportunity to, to help our whole community get better, mm -hmm. to be more able to, to more resilient. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's why I'm anti, not exercise, except that the word's got baggage. The word often means, um, like for me, phys ed where I was the last person chosen for all the ball sports in the team because I have got horrible hand-eye coordination. I can't catch a ball. Terrible. And I don't enjoy running at all. <laughs> and, you know, I played hockey and I, I broke my thumb before my piano exam. Um, that was just, you know, how to put someone off playing what actually could be a fun sport. Yeah. And I don't like team sports. I like doing stuff solo. So can't we do that? Mm. Have some okay. fun around. Yeah. Totally. So there's just more, there's more yeah. options, and yeah. it's not an exercise. The word itself is denotes a, a more rigid kind of like, which is sort of indoctrinated within us culturally, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of how we yeah. grow up, physical education. You run laps. You jump. You you know blah blah yeah. blah, blah blah blah. Which is yeah. what you're speaking to. There's yeah. just more. There's, we've got to be more adaptable in our prescription of movement. Yeah. Bearing in mind the individual. Yeah, we're going to think, what does this person love? What will they be motivated to do? Because motivation is about how important it is to you and how confident you are that you can mm. do it. And if you don't think it's very important, it doesn't fit for you, it doesn't feel like it's you, you are not going to do it, even if you could. Mm. Neither will you do it if, it doesn't, if you're not very confident. And for me, walking into, the, into a gym full of sweaty blokes and lycra, is like with loud music it's like the, the worst thing i could possibly do mm -hmm. I, I just don't want to go there yeah put me out fishing mm. <laughs> uh, um, I, I agree i think we've reached a <laughs> consensus Yay! um i think so that's i think we'll leave it there thank you yep. so much that's been it's just so much to get through and i'll link um to people some papers that you've written and also your blog as well uh, where can others uh, people find out about you? Are you on social? Are you on Twitter? You're on Instagram. On Twitter, yeah. Um, you'll need to look under a DMS free, which is not the easiest um, <laughs> handle. That was way back in the day. I've been on yeah. Twitter for a long time, okay. um, probably since its inception, I think. Um, I'm on uh, LinkedIn, and I'm also yeah. on Facebook, and people are welcome to connect. I'm nearing my um, limit on how many people I can connect with, so. Yeah following is probably easier yeah. um in the blog healthskills.co.nz um but otherwise i'm i'm sort of around all over the place usually you awesome. can't avoid me <laughs> <laughs> no we don't want to i think you're 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 a really needed voice especially in this time when there's a lot of like polarizing and yeah. and deliberately provocative and yeah 
quite terse conversation sometimes on yeah. social media. I think uh, you're a nice, I don't want to say gentle voice, but you're really like, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, but you're, you're, you're always quite diplomatic in, in how you talk. So I think that's really important. Yeah. It's not what people call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can see that I'm quite outspoken about what I think about because, mm. um, because we are often very dictated to and mm. we adopt that. And this social practice of calling one another out mm. serves to polarise and actually there's good that we can adapt from both, including, dare I say it, hands-on. Mm. Um, you know, we can use these things. It's just we're taking the focus off the person that we want to try mm. and help. Mm. It's who we're there for, not for ourselves. Mm. So. Let's not talk about hands on. That's a, we'll have to uh, we'll have to reconvene this conversation. <laughs> well, I'm very uh, happy to. We should okay, Adam, Adam and me. Yes. Let's do it. I'll, I'm happy to share that because um, <laughs> I I am Switzerland when it comes to that conversation. I'm I'm neutral, so uh, that could be interesting. I'm I'm neither really. I yeah. okay. I don't. I don't really care. Um, yeah. I've just had this big flare up and I've had a wonderful um, experience mm. with massage with a really mm. good massage therapist. Mm. My pain didn't change very much, but I tell you mm. what, I felt better. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's yeah. not doing anything magic. And yeah. she said that. This is mm. Rachel um, Arkit, who's one of my students and also mm. on social media. I just think sometimes we discount it because the evidence says and it can be misused, but then mm. so can exercise. Mm. So can sort of everything that we do. We've, it's moderation. Mm. It. No, no, I've, that is so, that's fundamentally, I agree with that in every possible sense of it. Whatever makes that person feel a bit better, as long as it doesn't breed dependency, you know, and you're not delivering them these messages like you're putting stuff in back into place and blah, blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, <laughs> and you're not jabbing people with needles. Yeah. That I'm not keen on. That's because I just don't like needles. <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right. Let's uh let's leave it there. Thank you so yep. much for your time, Bronnie, and we'll catch up soon. Yeah. Okay. Catch up. Bye. Bye.